I'm going to have you turn to two different places. Turn to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, easy to find. It's the last Old Testament book. And Mark chapter 2, if you would, and then go over to our text, which is Ezra chapter 9. And when you get there, go ahead and stand and I'll read it. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 9. And we might be jumping into Nehemiah, which they kind of go together, but we might be jumping into that next, next week. I'm going to go into chapter 10 a little bit, but right now let me just read chapter 9, and I'll read uh, I'll go ahead and read the first couple verses of chapter 10, and then that'll be it. But it says, "Now when these things were done." The princes came to me, the princes there just being like the principal people, like the uh, most important people, I guess you could say, the highest ranking people, <laughs> saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according, according to their abominations, even as the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites." For they have taken of their daughters, uh, for them taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of and, and of my beard. And sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the, of the God of Israel because of the transgressions of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished, astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings, and the our priests been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, and to, the, to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God might, uh, may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we are bondmen. Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the king of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolation thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servant, the prophet, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the land with their abominations which have filled it from one end to the other with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever that ye may be strong and eat of the good of the land uh, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all this has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hath pun hath, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as, as this, should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that, we, so that uh, there should be no remnant nor escaping? 
O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand before thee uh, because of this. Just two more verses. Chapter 10, Now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah the son of Jehiel, uh, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Uh, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, uh, let us make a covenant, sorry, three verses, <laughs> a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, uh, that's lower case L, so he's talking about Ezra, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Father, bless your word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you could be seated. Now, I have, uh, at the very beginning of this series, I don't know how much you remember it or even exactly how much I said about it concerning this, but knowing that this was coming, I, I remember mentioning that, you know, there's a point in here where, you know, some things happen where God didn't necessarily tell Ezra to do this, but he does it. So I briefly already have mentioned this idea of the marrying the strange wives. Last week, I, we got to this point. And I talked about the polluting of the godly seed and mingling it with the people of the lands. And so we talked about that and what was wrong with that and why God didn't want that. And so today is kind of a continuation of that. But the idea is that at this point of the story, Ezra, you know, is, is mourning about what the people have done. And particularly the religious leaders and the high uh, profile people there, how they have gone ahead and married you know, they've been in this foreign land for so long that they didn't even really think it was strange to just go after all these women of the land. <clears throat> and I mentioned last week, I believe, that it wasn't necessarily just because they were, you know, people of that land. It wasn't like a racist thing, like God's like, hey, you need to stay, you know, of this ethnicity and, and, never, and, and intermingle. And we know because the line of Christ, clearly God allowed for there to be a lot of people from other nations who became Jews and they followed after. But the problem is what happened every time they were doing this, they would go after those strange wives. They would go after their gods and they would disobey. And so this is why God said, don't do that. They're going to take away your heart. So I would say the same thing to people today. Like, hey, don't, you know, you need to find a good godly, you know, to my, my sons, find a good godly woman who loves the Lord and he's going to serve and and you're going to raise children to know you're going to be on the same page spiritually, and you're going to raise them in church and all these kinds of things. That makes sense, right? Uh, but obviously there are times where people make bad decisions and they end up kind of going after people who don't believe the same way and, and all that kind of stuff. So I want to talk about this here tonight, this idea of putting away their wives, which is what happens at the end of the story. And this is something that has been talked about a lot, and there are some different opinions as to whether this is right or wrong. There are some people who have said that there's a bit of a contradiction here because the Bible says not to divorce, and it says that God hates the putting away, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then there are other people, I mean, other places like this where there is putting away, and so some people would just call it a contradiction. Of course, I don't believe there's any contradictions in the Bible. So we want to ask the question, like, what is going on here? Why is this allowed to happen? Was it the right thing to do? Okay, so let's go over to Malachi chapter 2. And again, I, I know at the beginning of this series, we kind of already addressed this because I knew it was coming eventually, but now we're here, and so we're going to deal with it. And it's certainly not the first time I've addressed some of the things that we're going to talk about in this um, sermon in regards to divorce and remarriage and all. And, you know, a couple things about that. Number one, I realize who I'm talking to, and that really doesn't apply. I mean, who in here is in danger right now of getting a divorce? Right? It doesn't apply. I understand that. But it's where we are in the text. And so I'm going to preach that. Plus, we don't know who's listening online and who might have this question Believe it or not, this is a question I had several times come up since I've been a pastor 
uh, people have come to me and and asked, you know, what I thought about whether or not some, you know, you should get remarried. A person can get remarried after divorce, and they brought up different situations as to why they were divorced and and such. And and I've preached on this topic before, so you guys know where I stand on that. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, and bring it up again because of the sake that. A lot of people have pointed to Ezra in regards to there being some justification of putting away a wife. So, you know, hey, I married this person, and then they ended up being awful, and they, they hate the Lord, and they don't want to serve, and, and they're against everything I do, and so therefore I'm putting them away. And you say, oh, God says not to do that. And they'll point to, uh, what about, you know, Ezra here? And so this has kind of become a justification. But I'm going to bring out this, uh, this passage from Malachi. And if you look this up, you know, there, I don't know the exact timeline. But from what I understand and, and other sources that I've read, they've kind of confirmed that Malachi here is a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah. So he's, around, he's living around the same time and preaching these things, the Word of God, around the same time. And there's uh, certainly uh, some, of the, some of the things that he's writing in here would back that up and seem like, hey, he's, he's obviously talking about this same time period here. All right, so let's go uh, to chapter 2. And I'm just going to read the whole thing. I know I already read one chapter, but uh, hold tight while we read this one. And follow along and see if you can get out of it, maybe, uh, where I'm going, what, I'm, what I might be talking about. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessing. Yea, I have cursed them already. Uh, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. And, and that's not talking about the seed, uh, you know, the offspring. In this case, it's talking about the seed that they put in the field to grow plants. It says, I'm going to corrupt it, okay? And spread dung in your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them uh, to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn, away, turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Now, let's stop right there for a second. So why is he talking about Levi? Who, who, what's significant about Levi? Well, when we talk about the Levites, we're talking about that priestly tribe, the spiritual leaders. Uh, it was kind of inherited by birth, you know, and then they would be raised to be able to take these things. And again, here's what it says in, in, in verse 1. Oh, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. So we're talking about this priestly line of people, these rulers, these spiritual leaders. And in Ezra, we already see what happened, what they did. They went after these strange, uh, took, after, took these strange wives. And by strange, I don't mean like, <laughs> I mean like foreigners, okay? And, uh, and so he's talking to them and, and saying, hey, God used, you know, the offspring of Levi and you've been a holy people and all this Verse 8, but ye are departed out of the way, ye have caused many to stumble at the law, ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts, therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath, de hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this. 
the master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping, and with crying out, inasmuch as he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hands. Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, Take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is God of judgments? Okay, so most commentaries that you read will say that what's going on here, he's talking about like they dealt treacherously with the wife of their youth, and they'll say what's going on here is that these men put away their wives their, that they had married, like their Jewish wives, they put them away, and then they married these, these strange wives from the four lands. And they'll read that and say, that's what's going on here. And so when you get look at Ezra, what's, what they're doing in Ezra is putting away those wives now. And I'm not sure what exactly they're supposed to do next, but here's the reason that I struggle with that interpretation of what Malachi is saying. Because number one, if Malachi is talking about how they've mistreated their wives of their youth, right? They, they put their wives away, and then they went and found these other wives, and they went after them, uh, you know, if, if that's what happened. Because he's talking about how he's dealt treacherously with them and done these things. If that's what happened, well, we have a big problem then because according to the Bible, they can't go back to their original wife. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 24. This is something that came up as well since I've been a pastor where somebody had been divorced and then um, remarried and then um, I think that that person passed away and then so they were talking about going back to the first husband and, and it was a confusing situation but I'm trying to figure out what the Bible has to say and, and here's what we have in Deuteronomy of course, the Bible makes it clear anytime somebody passes away that they're not under that, um, obviously, they're not under that covenant anymore because that person's passed away, so they're, they're free to remarry at that point. But Deuteronomy 24, and look at verse 4. All right, so he's talking about... Um, the situations where somebody might, and this is just in the Old Testament law, where they might give a bill of divorcement and what have you. And, and, and it's, at the very beginning, it talks about finding uncleanness in the, the married person, but uh, seems to be talking about the fact that this was a person, once they got married, then it was found out like, hey, this person wasn't clean. They weren't a virgin like I thought they were, and so I've been deceived. And then they could kind of have an annulment, and, and I think this is what's going on. You know, that's why Jesus says, for, yet for the, uh, save for the cause of fornication, right? I think it's like, you know, the one time you can put them away is if you found out, hey, this person, this is not, clean. you know, they haven't consummated the marriage yet, but they said, no, I, you know, this person is not a virgin. And so <clears throat> here's what it says uh, in verse, let's go with verse 3. Um, and if the latter husband, uh, I'm sorry, let's do verse 2. And, and when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and give her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand, 
and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, uh, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Okay, so this is actually a, something that's repeated a few times in the Old Testament, and I believe in the New Testament as well, I think Jesus mentions it, but uh, is this idea that, hey, once you have remarried somebody else, you can't go back and take that first person to be, you know, that would be an abomination because you've already been with this other person. And so now it's kind of like having a, another affair, you know. And so this is something that's taught in the Bible. So why then would God want them to put away their wives that they're married to now because what is that going to profit anybody? Do they go back to the original wives or do they just put them away and then they just remain unmarried? Well, part of the, what God is saying that he wants here is that they will produce godly seed. And so they'll have children that, that can, they can grow in the Lord. Wouldn't they need wives to be able to do that? So either they're going to have to marry new wives, which again goes against what the Bible teaches about marriage. Uh, that are that are Jewish wives, you know, and then, or they would have to go back to their first wives, which the Bible says that they're not supposed to do. So what I think is going on is that um, Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, they're gung ho, they got the right intentions, they love the Lord, uh, but apparently they're saying, well, here's how we're going to handle this. We're going to put away those wives right now because, you know, if God doesn't like this. He's going to punish us for this. And so all these wives that you married of the foreign lands that aren't Jews, you need to put them away. And they all say, okay, that's what we're going to do. Now, I believe that God is speaking through Malachi here prophetically, you know, not, uh, as a prophet of God, and is saying, you know, here, you know, this putting away of the wives is the treacherous thing that you've done. Uh, you know, you have got to, um, you have got to make this right. And so, you know, there's a lot of things I could go from that and say, uh, you know, in a situation, and I'm going to talk about this here more in a minute, in a situation where somebody is married to uh, another person who maybe didn't, maybe wasn't a believer, you know, we knock on doors. I, I think I explained this last week. We knock on doors all the time where it's like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I was raised Baptist, whatever. And then my wife's a Catholic or, the, or vice versa, you know, or, or like, hey, they don't even believe in God. They're atheists. And I'm thinking in my head, like, how did you, if you grow up Baptist, how did you ever, and you're saved and everything by your testimony, how did you decide at some point you were going to marry this atheist and everything was going to just work out fine? You know, but now they're out of church, hadn't been to church forever, and there's fighting in the house and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, man, that, you should have like thought this through. All right, and this is uh, that more is more dealt with the message that I preached last week, uh, how we shouldn't intermingle with the world. Now, and when it comes to serving the Lord and, and marrying and, and actually doing something that's going to, uh, you know, bring your family to honor God, why would you go to the world and seek somebody who's not saved? And so this has always been the case with God's people. And with the Jews, there's no exception. They would pick up, and we see with Solomon, Married all these different wives, and they turned his heart away from the Lord, and he went after all these uh, false gods. Well, I don't know to what extent he did, but he allowed them to, and he built altars for them to do that, and all of that. So, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible indicates that if a person is married to an unbelieving spouse, um, they should stick with them, if at all possible. So this would be contradictory to what happened in Ezra's time, but I'm submitting to you that I don't think that Ezra was doing this by permission or by command of God. I think he was just thinking that this is what God wanted, and this is what he was telling the people. And, and I suspect Malachi... God was using Malachi to say, no, that's not what I wanted. Don't put away your wives. Okay, now I could be wrong on that. That's fine. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to consider that I'm wrong on that. But this makes a lot more sense to me. Okay, so look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. 
I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband. Now that's before they marry somebody else, okay? So my advice, if somebody comes to me and they've been divorced, and they're like, what do I do now? I wouldn't have any problem saying, like, is there any chance of you getting back with that original partner? That's fine, because they haven't been married to somebody else yet. You know, they that legally have separated, but in God's eyes, like they're still meant for each other, so they should get back together if at all possible. Okay, and this is what he's saying. Uh, let her be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Uh, okay, so, um, so it's very clear that he's saying, uh, you know, let me see here. Uh, okay, yeah, we got to keep going. But to the rest, uh, let's see here, sorry. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So here's the thing, uh, and then it says this, verse 15, I, got, I can't leave this out. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to, pe to peace, okay? And then he goes, you know, along saying, you know, he just got mentioned about not putting them away and all this kind of stuff and not getting remarried. And so there's no biblical example here for remarriage. However, there is a situation Paul brings up that somebody, you know, maybe they've already been married and then one becomes a believer. <clears throat> and the unbeliever says, man, you've really changed a lot since you've started going to that church. <laughs> you know? And I just don't want anything to do with your religion. Quit talking to me about that, whatever. And if they, and they say, like, hey, you know, well, I'll try not to offend you, but I can't not worship God. Like, this is, you know, where I am now. If the unbelieving spouse says, well, that's it, I'm out of here, and they walk out, like, this, it's not like they're supposed to be held. No, you can't leave because the Bible says blah, 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 and holding on to their legs or something like that. No, the Bible says let them depart. Okay, you're not under bondage. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. This person said, I don't want to be with you. But you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says that once they've departed, now you can just find yourself a good godly person. No, how about continue to pray for that person and try, hope that there's some kind of reconciliation that can work out, you know, maybe try to witness to them or whatever. Now I'm going to read another verse here in a, in a minute that kind of describes how if they stay together, the believing and the unbelieving, you know, what can be done in that situation. All right, but here's my advice. I'm going to give you just a couple, a few scenarios here. Here's my advice because these are the kind of questions that come up to me from time to time. So somebody, you know, maybe listening to this down the road or whatever uh, might be in one of those situations and want to know what the Bible says and what my thoughts on that are. And here they are. Okay, number one, to the person who has already been divorced and they've already been remarried, you know, what should I do? Should I put away my spouse? Like, no. My advice to somebody who's already been divorced and remarried is, you know what, it's, it's behind you now. You are married to this new uh, spouse, and you need to be loyal to them, and you need to be, uh, you know, you've, you've, it's already done. Okay, this is your spouse now. You need to make the best of that situation. Love your spouse. Do what the Bible says. Honor them and, uh, and obey the Lord. Okay, there's no... Uh, there's no reason for me as a pastor or anybody really to like beat somebody up who's already made this decision. Now, I do think it's good that everyone's on the same page. And so as a pastor, I'm, I'm not going to not preach it because somebody might not like it or something like that because I want to preach the truth of God's word. But I'm not going to sit there and beat somebody up or say, like, hey, this person's not worthy of something. Now, I would say that that person's not uh, a man's not qualified to be a pastor if he's been divorced and remarried because I have biblical grounds for that. 
but I'm not going to like think less of a person or not allow them to do certain things as long as they have un they understand uh, the situation and they're not going to try to do this again and they're you know then then there's no reason to beat them up over that. <clears throat> the only thing to be said is just you know continue on and treat that don't don't treat this spouse treacherously by divorcing them. Okay. Um, and then also I would say just be humble enough to know that you have brought yourself into this situation. You've brought some struggle and some problems upon your life, no doubt, that are going to be there because that's not the way God intended it. But that doesn't mean you can't keep serving God and he can't, uh, can't bless you. It's just you have to realize that that was your choice and, you know, don't blame God on that if things don't work out the way you wish that they would have. Okay, but uh, so that's easy one. That's my advice. You know, I'm not ripping anybody who's already made that decision in the past and it's a done deal and nothing they can do about it now. Okay, but if somebody is, comes to me and they're considering a divorce, now this has happened plenty of times where, you know, hey, the, I'm trying to serve the Lord. My spouse has no desire to serve the Lord uh, or maybe, you know, they've, They've done some st some stuff that wasn't wasn't nice, you know, wasn't good. They they can't get this out of their mind. I'm always going to think bad about this person, whatever the case is. Um, and so they're considering divorce, or maybe again their spouse they say is a non-believer or they just hate church. They don't want anything to do with with that. Look at First Peter chapter three. And there are plenty of examples, and people I could name, but I won't, of situations where this very thing has happened, and it worked out for good in the end. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning and plating a hair uh, in the wearing of gold and a putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And it goes on to talk about the women here, but realize in the context of this verse, what it's saying is, wives be in subjection to your own husbands. And then it adds this. Now, I've always taught this, that this is talking about the unbeliever. Okay, so like if it's a situation where they're with the unbeliever, if the woman will live as a godly woman and, and just live pleasing God and not be, you know, uh, nagging the husband who's not a believer and just, you know, arguing with them all the time and doing that, that's not going to win him over. But if she'll live for the Lord and he can see how, how good a holy woman is, a righteous woman is, it might win him over even though he hasn't obeyed the word. Now he might obey the word. But I've also heard this used to say it's not talking about an unbeliever necessarily. It's talking about somebody who just isn't obeying the word. And so, you know, if the wife is like, uh, you know, hey, we're, they're both Christians, but the wife is, it realizes that the husband's doing something that's not uh, in, a, in line with the word of God, instead of her, say, you know, chewing him out and arguing with him and all that, she could very well, through humility and, and just being the submissive wife, win him over and he would make the right decisions because of that. Now, look, I've seen that happen tons of times. I'm sure it's even happened to me when I'm doing some, making some decisions that aren't, you know, in accordance to what God would want me to do, and my wife is approaching it in the right manner, and I'm seeing her behavior and thinking, oh, you know what? She's right, you know? Uh, whereas if it begins an argument, a lot of men uh, particularly would probably stand, uh, you know, take a, a stand and say, like, I'm not going to listen to her. And, uh, and so, you know, and the opposite is true, too. We understand that in the same context, Wives are supposed to be submissive to the, to the husbands and loving in that way. Husbands are supposed to be loving to the wives in the sense that they're taking care of them. They're honoring them as the weaker vessel. They're 
uh, you know, respect, giving them respect and showing them care and protection and all that kind of stuff. And when a husband treats the wife that way, well, then she's more likely to be won over as well. So this is just about if you continue to live for God in a marriage where one, par one partner's not doing right, you know, it might be that they will be won over by, this, by the fact that you are doing right. So what am I saying? Like in the context of our story here, what would the advice seem to be, just based on comparing Scripture to Scripture, what would the advice seem to be to these men and these priests who have taken on these, these strange wives? Well, are they the head of the house or are they not? So they could say, hey, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to serve your father's gods. You're going to serve, you know, Jehovah God. And they can make sure. And that's obviously going to be a struggle. It's obviously going to be a fight. But at the end of the day, these priests would say, hey, I am ruling my house well. And therefore, I am, you know, capable, qualified to rule the house of God. And so they were married in this situation and it, it, it didn't look like a good deal because of the fact that they made bad choices. They chose the wrong person. But now they can decide to serve the Lord and decide like, hey, I'm going to raise my children uh, this way. You know, particularly these guys who are spiritual leaders and, and all that, they can put their foot down. Now, if the wife decides, hey, that's it, I'm running back to dad, you know, this guy wants to make me a Christian or whatever and leaves, that's a different story, okay? Now, I still wouldn't recommend remarrying, but at that time, they have done nothing wrong. They've stood, stood for God, and, it, and, and the, the spouse chose to, to leave. But very likely, what would happen, as it did in many stories in the Old Testament, is this person would just see the godly lifestyle and the principles and the characteristics that are based off God's Word and say, you know what? Actually, I want to serve that God. Actually, I want to be part of these people. And they would convert. You know, and so I don't see any reason why the advice should be, yeah, let's put the wives away. Okay, so I don't believe that is, uh, was what happened or what God wanted. Um, look at Matthew chapter 5. So if somebody comes to me and just says, you know, hey, I just... The past is the past. This was a wicked person. There's no way we could ever get along. You don't understand their characteristics and our personalities just don't match up and, and what have you. And they come to me saying like, you know, but what if I want to marry somebody else and it's a godly person and so I want to marry them? You know, here's what my advice would be. The words of Jesus says, but I say unto you, this is verse 32, Matthew 5, 32, that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication. And again, I believe that the reference, when cross-referenced with Deuteronomy, is saying like, hey, this, there's one case where you can do that, and that is you haven't consummated the marriage yet, and you find out that the person that you're with was not a virgin, then you can put them away, which is what we have a, st we have a story. Jesus' own you know, mother and Joseph almost separated because Joseph thought that she had lied to him and she wasn't a virgin. But Joseph was told by the Holy Spirit, no, this is actually, he is actually with the child of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so we have that example that kind of backs this up. Uh, Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now, why would God ever want to encourage somebody to be adulterers and adulteresses. He wouldn't, okay? So the, my recommendation, not my recommendation, but you know, my advice is always going to be when somebody says, like, what do you think I should do? I'm going to point to the Bible and says, well, this is what Jesus says to do. Don't put them away. God hates the putting away, right? He hates divorce. It's very clear that that's what, I've heard someone say, like, well, putting away is different than divorce. No, it's interchangeable in the Bible. So uh, that's, a, that's a kind of a silly argument, I think. But uh, anyway, this is what the Bible says. Now, I personally believe that that would, because some people will look at this verse here and say, like, if their spouse cheats on them after they're married, then that's grounds for divorce. That's a very common teaching out there. I don't see it, because here, this fornication that it's talking about is something that happens before marriage, 
uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, adultery. Okay, the adultery here is if you put somebody away and then they marry another person, that's adultery. But um, but if it's the case of fornication, that's a different that's a different subject. That's not adultery. Okay, so anyway, um, what about this argument? Because here is what has been brought up to me before. Okay, my spouse, not mine. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm talking for somebody else. Okay, if somebody would come to me and say, like, I was married and my spouse, they committed adultery. And I would say, okay, well, that still isn't grounds for divorce. And then they would say this. But under the Old Testament law, an adulterer should be put to death. And if my spouse was put to death then I'd be free to marry another person. Is that true? I mean, I mean technically, isn't that true? If, if we were under Old Testament law, okay, and our government said, you know, here is the new, here's this new law, that if you are found committing adultery on your spouse, you could be stoned to death, you know? And if somebody committed adultery and they were stoned to death, would that, pers- would that spouse be free to marry another person? Well, of course they would, because till death do us part, now my spouse is dead. Okay. Now, here's the thing about it. Some people right now would be like, I would never vote for such a law. I would never say that an adulteress should be, what about Jesus? You know, let him that's without sin cast the first stone. And, and I've heard all these arguments about that, about how silly of a, of a, of a law that would be. But I'm just going to tell you right now, if our government, now I can't, it's not my, nowhere in the Bible do, am I given permission to stone somebody to death because they've committed adultery? Okay, that's not how it worked. That's why Jesus, they came to Jesus and said like, hey, we, shouldn't we stone her to death? You know, Jesus didn't even have the authority to do that. I mean, as God, he did, but in the legal system, he didn't. It would have had to go before the judge and all this kind of stuff, all right? <clears throat> but if our government, it's never going to happen, but just hear me out. If our government said, you know, adultery is punishable by death. And then you go down the line in the Bible, homosexuality, punishable by death. And you know, all these people, uh, if you have this conversation about how that's in the Old Testament, that's the death penalty, homosexuality. And they'll say, well, what about this? The Bible also says that if a, pers- if a kid, you know, is like cursing his mother and father, they should be put to death. Amen. Like, I, I, look, I'm not saying that it's easy to like, oh, yeah, I want our kids to be put to death or something like that. Here's what I'm saying. If our government decided, hey, we're going to go back to Old Testament law, wouldn't it be silly for me to be like, oh, no, that's a bad law when God's the one that created it? <laughs> All right. So, so just recently, you know, this movie came out, and I don't know much about the movie, but you've probably heard about it, uh, that's dealing with trafficking. I can't even remember what it's, what it's called, something about freedom. Anybody remember, know what I'm talking about? Uh, something about freedom. It's dealing with uh, human trafficking. It's been all over the news. And anyway, uh, it's real. Uh, the right wing conservatives are are really like lifting it up, and the and the left wing like seem to hate it and not want anybody to to see it or so, something like that. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. And so <laughs> Trump came out and said, I know he's not the president, but he came out and and called for if we find any human trafficker, they should be put to death. And of course, so many people are being like, oh, what a radical, like what a crazy person. Now look, there's a lot of things about Trump and a lot of things Trump has said that I don't like. But here's the thing, if Trump was president and he said, hey, we're calling for all human traffickers to be put to death, how could I say like that's a terrible law when the Bible says anybody who is a man stealer right? That's literally what's going on. They're stealing people and then selling them into the market and all this kind of stuff should be put to death. What kind kind of Christian would I be to say like, oh, that's a terrible law? Because God's the one that came up with that law, okay? Now, but the, the reality is we're in a government now that doesn't have those laws and they haven't enforced those laws. And it's been so many years and generation after generation, we're desensit, I mean, we're a little bit desensitized to our laws today And the thought of those kinds of things, it's like, oh, no, that's not the Christian way. That's not the right way. But it's justice. That's the way God proclaimed it. So theoretically, if there was a law that said someone commits adultery, they need to be put to death, I would back it. I'd be like, amen. It's in accordance to the Bible. It's not wrong. Okay? But the reality is we don't have that law. Okay? So so if somebody does commit adultery, uh, there is no way that you're going to be able to 
put that person to death, and now you're free to marry another one. First of all. Second of all, I'm under the persuasion that there was, it was, that there was always the um, potential for some grace in that manner. For instance, Joseph, right? He's a just man, not willing to put his wife away. Uh, I mean, um, willing, I can't remember how he said it. <laughs> Being a just man and not willing to put his wife away. I can't remember now, my mind's going blank. But he says he decides to put her away privily, okay? And uh, he doesn't want everybody to know what happened, and so he doesn't want her to be stoned to death. He's just putting her away. Uh, that's the way I understand that text. I think there was always a case for mercy. However, people had the right to say, like, hey, they have robbed me of, you know, having a godly life and, and all this stuff. And, and so they could have put them before the judges. The judges could have declared, hey, they're guilty and put them to death, and then that person would be free to marry another person. So I, I said all that, that. I went a long way there to tell you this, that there have been people that have said to me, like, my spouse committed adultery, and if we were in an Old Testament law, they'd be put to death, and I'd be able to marry another person. So what's my advice? My advice is, yeah, but we're not under that law right now, and your spouse hasn't been put to death, so what do you do? You know, I'm not going to tell somebody to pray for that person's death, but you know what? If you just trust God and follow God and try to live godly as a single person and, and to, to do the right things, you know, it could be God's judgment upon that person that he does end up taking their life. And then this person would be free to marry another. But maybe he's not going to. And maybe you're just stuck being single for the rest of your life and you say, well, it's not my fault. This person committed adultery and they don't treat me right and what, what have you. So it brings me to my third point real fast. If somebody is divorced or their, sp their spouse left them, whatever, how, you know, maybe it wasn't their choice, but whatever the case, they end up in this situation where they are divorced, but they're considering remarriage. And this is the one that I've gotten a whole lot of, of uh, questions on, you know, because they want permission basically to remarry somebody because of the fact that they're divorced. And again, maybe they'll say, but my spouse committed adultery or whatever, and that's why I divorced him. Okay, here is what I want to say about that. Number one, the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, somebody who's single in that situation is going to say, like, it's just not fair. I look around, and there's all these people that have these wonderful relationships, and I got stuck with this loser and, and all this stuff, and it's just not fair. Uh, now I can never marry again. And, uh, and, it's, and, and I'm going to be lonely the rest of my life. Okay, number one, the grass is always greener. Here's what happens a lot of times. And I've watched it with my very own eyes and, and, and had to give counsel afterwards that they decide to go ahead and go with it anyway. Well, I want to be happy, and so I'm going to do it my way, even though it goes against what God says. Oh, can they still have a happy marriage? Can they still do right? Of course they can, right? But here's the thing. I have also met people who have said, you know what? There's something better. I mean, I'm sorry. There's something worse than being lonely and, and, and not having a spouse. And that's being married to somebody who's the wrong spouse. <laughs> okay? And so, like, by somebody jumping out there and going against God and saying, well, I'm just going to marry this person anyway. Well, you know what? Again, going back to number one, if someone's already been through this, they've already been mar married and divorced, like, just humble yourself to know that you made that decision. And so now when things aren't going right and you're, everything within you is saying, like, I want to get a divorce because I can't handle this relationship. Hey, you're the one that took that relationship, even though the counsel was not to do that because God said not to. And so you just have to be willing to humble yourself and accept that. That's just the reality of it. And then the second thing is just to trust the Lord and... Uh, and it doesn't matter, you know, if, if, if you think it's fair or you think that, hey, it's not right that I should be lonely the rest of my life or whatever. Hey, why not just trust God? God knows what's best for you, and he might bless you in an amazing way if you just do it his way and be faithful and patient and wait on the Lord. Okay, but that doesn't mean we're going to jump to some conclusion that says, like, hey, I want you to be happy, so go ahead and do something contrary to what God wants for you. Well, don't we know, don't we have faith enough to say that God wants for us is going to be the best for him and the best for us in the long run? 
And so you, let's say someone dies and they've, you know, they were divorced, they had a bad marriage or whatever, and then they die having never remarried. And, you know, maybe God allowed them to go through their entire life in loneliness, which hopefully they didn't feel lonely their whole life because they went ahead and served God and, and followed him and got past that. Uh, but maybe they did. Who, you know, do you think God was not watching this person's life and is not capable of rewarding them for making the right decision to follow his word? The Bible says that any man who's given up wives or houses or lands or any of that stuff, you know, in heaven, he's going to be rewarded a hundredfold. I don't, that doesn't mean you're going to have a hundred spouses, okay? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> that wouldn't necessarily be a blessing, okay? Uh, but they're going to be rewarded, however God re gives out rewards, rewarded abundantly for the fact that you chose to serve God and not put your own feelings first and say, like, woe is me. I shouldn't be lonely. It's not right. Uh, it's not fair. No. Worship God. He knows what he's doing. If bad things were done to you because of sin and a sinful person, or if you made bad choices and it came to this situation, serve God, get right with him, and he's going to smooth everything out, and he's going to make the best possible situation out of it if you'll just let him do that. But I can never recommend to somebody to put away their, their spouse I can never recommend to somebody to remarry another person unless death is the cause of the separation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And uh, sometimes things are unpopular to preach and sometimes things are hard to preach, Lord. But I have faith and uh, just want to follow your word to the best of my ability. In areas where I'm wrong, Lord, I pray you just show me and uh, help me to understand uh, but at the same time, Lord, I pray that you'll always keep me uh, focused on preaching the truth and all of our people here and anyone listening to this, Lord, I pray that uh, it would speak to them in a way that would help them to seek first your righteousness. And uh, we know that you will uh, provide if, they, if we'll just do that. And so I pray, Lord, you help us learn from this story of Ezekiel, I mean, of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and putting away of these wives. And help us learn from that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.